Okay, so the last three weeks, we've had the, the opportunity to really look at Jonah and what the story, the, the historical story of Jonah, not only meant to him and the people of Israel, but means to us. And we looked at three sort of overarching questions and that tied in with his story. Do we love God? Do we trust him? And do we love his people? So our conversation tonight will hopefully not be like a, a reteaching of the message, but will be a way for um, all of us to realize that we're not alone in this. And that, you know, no one up here has it all figured out except Pastor Tom. Oh, yeah. The rest of us, we're still figuring it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The more I figure it out, the more I realize what I don't know. <laughs> so, <true. laughs> so we're going to just share um, personal experiences, personal thoughts, how these questions and the scriptures involved have affected us. And um, hopefully you will leave here feeling like um, encouraged and, and also know that you are not alone as you walk and learn how to walk more closely with God as you see him more. So the, I'm going to start with an easy one. <laughs> we talked about how um, Jonah heard God. He got his commandments, and we looked at having God's commandments and keeping God's commands. Well, we talked about how the word comes, and actually after speaking, uh, several people came up to me and said, you know, that was great because I'm really struggling with knowing how to hear God's voice or what is, what is it when God's speaking. We looked at three things. He speaks to the church. He speaks to us through his spirit. He speaks over us through others like our calling and whatnot. So let's just talk. Let's talk a little bit about hearing God and what does it mean to you? Have you had an, even better, have you had a specific experience where you felt like either you could not hear God and what did that mean, or you, you really heard him and you knew what it meant and you, you, you did something with it? So I don't know if any, I don't want to know who wants to start here, but um, I can blindly pick. Pastor Sheena? You don't do this. You do this in school. <laughs> <laughs> you always say pass. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hard because my last name was Abraham, so I sat in the front so I couldn't hide. Um, it's, uh, while reading through the, first of all, the last three weeks have been phenomenal. Um, just going back and listening. So if you miss some weeks, go back and listen. Um, but I was thinking, um, two instances came to mind, um, like, when I knew that I heard the Lord. And I can't help but think, one specifically, um, whenever I was recovering with Joshua, and my first reaction is to tell as many people as possible to pray, like, just pray. And the Holy Spirit, I felt him so clearly say, don't share. And he only gave me specific people to cover me. And I didn't understand why until I spent the 12 weeks just he and I and hours and hours of teaching because you realize people speak into you without, you know, running their mouth without really knowing what to say. And so that specifically, like when I really heard the Lord with that. And then the second time when I didn't hear the Lord, it was me, um, like, you know, when you have things in your life that are straight up red flags, but the, the red flags are so large, you just ignore them. And it took, you know, <laughs> and actually I remember when it made me laugh because it was actually Pastor Tom. It had Pastor Tom, he took me to his office. It was in a relationship, I was in a relationship years ago. And he was like, if you don't break up with this guy, I'm going to fire you. And I was like, what? Can you do that? He said, no, but I love you. And I was like, and it was like, but to me, I couldn't hear the Lord because I was so desperate and I was looking for everything else. So the Lord used Pastor Tom and my, you know, my parents, but PT pulling me in was like, I don't, do you remember that? I feel like you, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> He's like, I, I'm going to fire you. And I was like, and it clicked. 
And so I think those are the two instances. You, know, like, you have to remember, I'm old. <laughs> the lawyer told him. Your not youth to is renewed it. like the <laughs> eagles. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, yeah. so I can more clearly understand you, Sheena. I have to put my hearing in. Put your ears in. Okay. Put your ears in. Well, you're just lucky because every time that he was like, hey, let me talk to you, son, he had a chainsaw in his hands. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. At least That's you just got called to his office. Because you act like a fool. I'm you know what I mean? Like, like wait a minute here. Why do you always have to have a chainsaw in your hands, you know? Because <laughs> you make dumb choices. I make somewhat dumb choices. <laughs> so she was, she was saying when, when you threatened to fire her, because she was dating a guy that was not from the Lord. Yeah, I, I, well, I probably wouldn't have had to fire you because had you pursued that, okay, you'd have probably been pursuing your own demise. This is true. And I couldn't hear the Lord in the midst of that because I was so blinded by my own needs instead of, and I thought I was being obedient and it was not obedience, it was stupidity. And so he, and, he, and it was just, you know, oh my goodness, like, and so the Lord used PT to kind of punch me in the face. And here I am. He did not physically punch me in the face, people, but <laughs> spiritually. <laughs> okay, next. Matt, call someone else. <laughs> no, I think that's great because you, you were saying, like, you struggled hearing because you had fog and all that, but then I feel like what you're also saying is that God brought someone in. Correct. Yeah. to speak to you, and then you listen to that, and the fog eventually lifted. You know, that's the... But when you're in that fog, you don't see clearly. No. Okay, that's... that's and we've all been there. You know, you, you're, you, you get your focus on things that, in a sense, that you want so badly, okay? Because I know you wanted to be married. You wanted a family. That's what your heart's desire was. But it's so easy to so to pursue that to a, to, a, to a degree that you literally take a path where the enemy has deceived you. And because you waited, you were patient, you wanted to fulfill God's will, then look what God has given you. Yes, absolutely. And that's why it's important to be around counsel, like seek godly counsel, people who will give you good counsel, not someone who like likes to sit in the junk with you, as in like feeds the negativity. You need people to be like, no, this way. And you, even though there could be some resistance, praise God, that there is like, no, you need to listen. I care about you. <laughs> I don't want to see you end up in just shenanigans. And so, yeah, shenanigans. And I would say you, it worked, like what you just said, because you wanted you wanted to see God in that situation. So you wanted to hear truth no matter how hard it was. And that's that's like a pre prerequisite. A prerequisite, I think, to you hearing you God. to say. No. <laughs> Not so much, I guess. <laughs> anybody anybody else have have something on that thought to share about hearing or not hearing? Well, I think God can use circumstances too of just uh uh, how do I want to put this? I, I, I want to be careful because it could be easily misconstrued. But I think God can use dissatisfaction in your life to guide you and, and, and direct you. Because when I, when I was endeavoring to make the, the step to go into Bible school, I remember the job that I was working at. It, it, um, I was being promoted there, and, and it was in a sense like I seemed to have a good future, but I was so dissatisfied there. So unhappy. I mean, times, I mean, I would just come home and want to cry because I've, it was just not working. And I think that dissatisfaction in that also helped to push me more and more over into this place of making the decision of where God wanted me to be. You know, just like a child, you got to nudge them, whether it be with a ball bat or a chainsaw. Okay, so you, you got to nudge them, you know, but... On the other hand, again, seriously, that that nudging helps to move you into that place where God wants you to be. And then he'll confirm it. He'll confirm it. And I remember, I think it was after the in the first week in Bible school, I'm sitting there, and I was probably one of the older people there. I was 26 years old at that point. And the rest of these, these were kids, 
okay, just fresh out of high school. Some of them didn't even graduate high school, and they were there in Bible school. And I remember that this came so strong to me. I thought, what in God's name am I doing here? I quit my job, okay, and I'm sitting in this Bible school with all these children, okay. What did I do? What did I do? But there was still that inner realm where it's like, I really believe this is what God wants me to do. And even in the dissatisfaction of pushing me in that direction, it, it can work that way. And so don't despise, in a sense, that realm of, of dissatisfaction. You know, you just may be an unhappy person in life. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, just unhappy in life. But if God is endeavoring to move you into a particular direction for his purpose and for his plan, then uh, there may be times of dissatisfaction. I mean, you don't look at Jonah. <laughs> you know, with, with Jonah, you know, it's just this. He, and, and it got me to thinking, too, with concerning Jonah, the, the difference. You know, and I, I never really thought about this before, but the difference between uh, dis, uh, 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 unbelief and disobedience. It's like, there's a difference. There's a definite difference there because I believe that unbelief will lead you into disobedience. Unbelief will, and that's exactly, uh, in a sense, what happened with Jonah. You know, there was an element of unbelief there in a sense that God would not fulfill what Jonah thought he should fulfill. Okay, so in, in, in that sense, but it led him into a realm of diso and disobedience. And then, you know, another thing I thought about Jonah is like, in, in, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Jonah again, and this time Jonah obeyed the Lord. And I'm thinking, you know, well, God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. But then I got to thinking about other instances in the scriptures when God was not the God of the second chances. Okay, I thought of the Israelites when they were on the threshold of going into the promised land and they disobeyed God, come back with the evil report. And, and after Moses rebuked them and said, you know, this is it, we're going into the wilderness and they're all that faithless generational die off. We're sorry, you know, we should have taken the land. And the next thing, that they're now going to go up and endeavor to take the land. And Moses says, once again, you're disobeying God and God's not with you. God gave them an opportunity, but he gave them one opportunity. And from there, and I thought of Uzzah, who touched the ark of God. He didn't get a second chance, okay? So that's what began to, to move me into that realm of unbelief and, and, and um, um, disobedience. Dis disobedience. Yes, thank you. Uh, unbelief and disobedience. So... Uh, uh, and yeah, but it's if I pondered that and thought that, and and it's like, how does this stuff work? What about David? David committed adultery. Uzzah touched the ark. Okay, David committed adultery and then murder. They were both punishable by death. Why did Uzzah die and David got a pass? And I really believe again, it's like I ponder these things. Why is that? Why did he get a pass? The creep. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what he did was terrible, absolutely terrible. Uzzah tried to salvage the ark because I think they, they came into the threshing floor of, was it Nacor? I think something like that. And, and the, ark, the, the, the oxen stumbled and the ark began to rock, okay? And Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. That's all he, that's all he did. But he touched in the flesh, he touched the presence of God, okay? And it wasn't an issue that God, I don't believe, wanted to destroy him for that. But in our flesh, we cannot experience the presence of God. God himself said that no man can see my glory, touch my glory, and live. But I think that David, the reason David got the past that he did, because God said, to Samuel, I will look and I have found a man after my own heart. And I don't believe David ever lost that. Even in his stupid moments, he never lost that. That man after God's own heart. And God saw that in him. God saw that in him. 
Uzzah, he died for a different reason. David was worthy of, die, die, of death, but because he had such a heart for God. And then the Israelites, it was just raw dis, 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 or unbelief, and it led them to disobedience. So, anyhow. Yeah, I mean, David also did pay dearly with the life of his son. He, he didn't, his son died. Um, and it, it reminds me of when I was looking through a lot of this, one of the things I came across was the idea that there are both instances in the Bible, and I just think, well, when Paul says, you know, should we sin that grace might increase, may it never be, we have this, some people do get this perceived second chance, some people don't. It's better to just obey the first time. <laughs> it really yeah, is. and that, that's really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just close this question out. Just one thing I wanted to, this memory I have of just knowing God's, you know, will or whatever is just, I remember standing at the altar waiting for all the bridesmaids to come down at my wedding and I was a groom. I'm coming down and I remember being like on the verge of tears, like this is amazing and and this is just follow me for a second. I, this might not sound like how it should on the surface. But when they all were there and then the bride, Jenny, was in the back, it's like that all just faded away. It's not like I wasn't overjoyed or, or anything, but it's like the most peace I've ever experienced, probably to that point and since that point, came over me in that moment. And I felt like the closest... To, uh, to I could get on earth this hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> I'm well pleased. Like, I still have to wait to hear that. I hope I will hear that. But that was that moment. And it was just super clear to me, like, this is what God wants for me. And, um, you know, it was really cool. Well, if I can, if I can add, I, I think because a lot of people do struggle with understanding God's will. And that, I mean, that's a big topic. Uh, there's a lot of messages on it. There's a lot of articles. There's a lot of blogs. There's a lot of things on it's like, what's God's will for my life? What's God's plan, his, his purpose? And, and, and something that I discovered just, just in, in study is that the will of God is the word of God. And, and I, think that's, I think that's one of the biggest things. I think we're, we're, we're trying to seek so much outside of, of God's word, you know, like, cause he's already given us his love letter. He's already spoken to us. You know what I mean? So I, I think that some of the biggest thing is, is sometimes I think the best thing that you can do if you're, if you're, you know, confused in an area, if you're, if you're struggling in an area, trying to, trying to find some clarity, uh, with certain things in, honestly, the last thing that we often do is kind of like come to God's word. Like, it's like, I mean, that, it, that, I, like that, that should be the first response, but all of a sudden it's almost like we, we try every other avenue to see if it works. And then when it doesn't, we come to God in like a panic, you know? And, and I said this on Sunday that, it, that, that really that's so often our lives, our lives are in this panic, our lives are in this confusion, our lives are in this fog. But man, like imagine if we were just doing what, what God wanted us to do to begin with is to be still and know that he is God, you know, um, I, I, I bookmarked this and I thought about this. I think this is when, um, this is when Jesus walked on water in, uh, in John chapter six and, and you have the disciples that are panicking and Jesus called out to them. He said, do not be afraid. You know who I am. And I think that's some of the biggest thing is recognizing and realizing that in those, in those times is, is it sometimes seems so simple, but it's just coming back to the basics and it's just like, okay, God, what does your word say about this? You know, and I, and I, there's so many times in my life to where, um, you know, you don't feel the, the spiritual tingles or whatever, you know, and all that stuff, the goosebumps and everything, but just simply sitting down and saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me. It's like, because I really need to hear your voice. I really, and because your word is the only word that's going to lead 
to, to life and to lead to peace and, and exactly where I need to go. And, and more often than, I, I've just found it more often than not in my life. And sometimes there's, there's those times where you get in and it's just like, man, God, I needed to hear something and I didn't hear anything. But, but it's not getting discouraged and just recognizing that, you know what, Father, I planted that seed. I put, I put your word in and it will not return void. You know, because because that is who you are and that's what you want for my life. And so I just think the biggest thing, though, if anyone's questioning that, if anyone's just in a difficult journey right now, just looking for clarity in a situation, the will of God for your life is the word of it. It's not a job. It's not it's not a hobby. It's not some kind of outlet in the physical. It may manifest itself in that kind of way, but really the will of God is the word of God, and it's just get into God's word. He's already spoken to us, and allow his word to illuminate that. I mean, you have it at the top here. I used it on Sunday, but I pray in your hearts. This is Paul in Ephesians. I pray in your hearts. Your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given those that he has called um, the passion puts it that he will that that his light will illuminate the eyes of your heart and uh, the eyes of your imagination. And I think that's some of the biggest thing that we just we need to stop looking so naturally and allow allow the word to illuminate the eyes of our imagination. And I think in those ways, man, we'll find we'll find more clarity. He wants to do more than we could ever ask, think or imagine. So he'll bring such a clarity and such an understanding in those situations. When we're just obedient, be faithful in the little. Be faithful in the little and watch what God can do. So, well, As I think about that too, dealing with the fact it's not always in the spectacular where God speaks. Sometimes God speaks in the most simple, you know, plain things. Because I got to thinking, I think it was Elijah that went on the mountain and, uh, you know, he was looking for the presence of God. And it was an earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. There was a fire. God wasn't in the fire. Okay, there was a strong wind. God wasn't in the wind. And then there was a still, small voice. And that's what, that was God. And I think oftentimes we possibly miss the presence of God. Or what the Holy Spirit is saying in some of the simplest things of life that are all around us in creation. But it's so normal for us. It's so everyday for us. For, that, that we often just overlook those things. And um, so, anyhow. Sometimes I wonder if we think, and Jonah had a specific word. He had, you know, he was supposed to go somewhere. And there are times where we, we definitely feel like we have a, you know, we need to be doing something and we know it. And if we walk away, we, we know we're, ignoring something but sometimes I also wonder if if it really is has more to do with an attitude like do I take that job or that job it's like I don't know if God cares which one you take you know they could be equally but if I take this one and we feel like it's like a choose your own adventure like I won't be as blessed and then this one happened and that one happened and that one happened and like Sometimes, I don't think this is every time, but I think there are times where it's more like, God, I want to be obedient to you. I've got two great options here. I've had people speak into my life and say these are both great options. I'm just going to have to actually make a choice and take responsibility for it. <laughs> like, so anyway. But when the heart is pure, the choice will be right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's Psalm 34 says, the steps of a good man or a good woman, okay, are ordered by the Lord. And even and that was that was so encouraging to me when I had to make that decision to finally quit my job, go to Bible school. And and because the next verse says, though he fall, even though I may make a mistake, God upholds him with his hand. Okay? In other words, he's not going to forsake you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. When the heart is pure, blessed are the pure. In heart, for they shall see God. And that just broke open to me years ago. In this sense, when your heart is pure, you will 
you'll see where God is and where God isn't. Blessed are the pure in heart. They'll see God. Oh, God's in this, but he's not in that. Okay. How do I know that? Well, my heart is pure. I'm not looking for anything except his will and his purpose. And so therefore, he'll lead, he'll guide. So I got other, one other question. That is mic drop worthy oh, right there. Really, that was really good. Yeah, I, got a, I yeah. got a real puzzling question. Okay. Where'd you get socks that says Twizzle is on it? Okay, I mean, really? My mother-in-law. <laughs> she keeps me stocked. <laughs> I got York peppermint patty. I got Reese's. I got that's amazing. The whole family <laughs> making me hungry You're though. Just a walking billboard. <laughs> uh, anyhow, moving right along. <laughs> um, if, if no one else has anything else on that, I don't want to stop a great conversation. I, I would love to. Look at move into that second question that we talked about trusting God, and we looked at um, how um, Jonah really had a difficult time trusting that God would do what He wanted Him to do, um, and we also looked at Abraham and how he, in a sort of an opposite way, he implicitly trusted God because of his experience and who God was, and even to the point where he was gonna kill his own son. I mean, I feel like my movie mind is like, he was like seconds away, like the, that shot where the knife is like, you know, like right there, and God was like, wait. Um, so I wonder if there has um, been a time in our lives where we've really either struggled and, you know, not that we need to air dirty laundry, but, you know, it can be a little real. Um, struggle to trust, to actually do what we know he wants us to do. Um, or a time where you felt like that really paid off and you really saw it was very hard to do, but like you really saw that uh, happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it's kind of like similar to Pastor Tom. Um, when I was a senior in high school, um, I was looking for colleges, and I just came back from a mission trip from Brazil. I spent two and a half weeks in an orphanage my senior year of high school, and um, I went college shopping, and I got, I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to make bank, I'm going to wear Gucci, and I'm going to be amazing. So um, <clears throat> so my mom took me to college shop, and um, I checked out Fordham Law University, um, and then the Lord already told my mom and my grandma that I was going into ministry, like when I was 13, my, they already knew I felt a sense, and I went on this mission trip, and I, I felt the Lord already tell me I was going to go into ministry, but I fought it, because I'm like, first of all, I ain't going to be broke, okay? Like, <laughs> I don't think so, and I'm a woman, and the women, I was, like, growing up, you know, I, I, when I wrestled through high school, it was like, women belong in the kitchen and the nursery, and I was like, I can't cook, and I hated kids, <laughs> so I was like... <laughs> I can't do it. And so um, I applied to pre-law, and I got into pre-law, and my mom was like, you're not going to be a lawyer. And she took me to Nyack College, and she's like, you're going here. And I, I was like, oh. And the Lord worked, and everything worked out. And, and I went for pastoral ministry and intercultural studies, and I look back now. And first of all, I could not be an attorney. No. First of all, it wouldn't work out. Um, and, I, and, and I see now the fact that, like, if that obedience and having, once again, people, you know, speaking over me, but it was really hard because I had to give up a dream. Like, I wanted to because I grew up poor, and I was like, I don't ever want to see my family struggle in the future. And I let go of that dream, and God gave me a way better dream. And did going into ministry, that didn't happen right away. And in fact, if it wasn't for Pastor Nathan, I wouldn't even be here. Because um, Pastor John's like, we don't need Sheena. 
And look, I, I became <laughs> Pastor Nathan's sidekick for years in youth ministry. He has so much to say about you. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks, boo. And so, um, <clears throat> but it is, it's like, I, I, I look back and I'm like, oh my, it was really hard to give up dreams that I thought they, uh, that was from the Lord, but they were mine. Like, I, because I, I'm a planner. I, as soon as as soon as December hits, I'm buying myself a new planner. I got stickers. I'm ready to go. And but the Lord had to break me of things. And so looking back now, just thinking like that was a hard dream. Like I'm like, bye pre law. And then I got and, you know went to Nike and it changed my life. And it wasn't even for ministry. It's for growth. Like the ripping apart of the belief that I had, you know, the things that I grew up, know, like, especially as a woman in ministry, like being taught women don't preach, you don't become a pastor, you don't do any of those things. And then to have people empower me and then to come on here and then being empowered, it's just, it was a game changer. So that's a That's thing. awesome. That's a, yeah. Clap for the lady. Hi, Matt. I, I hey, um, Before I get in, I do have a great example here, but before I get into it, I feel like we owe you a nod. You told, I feel, the funniest joke I've heard in a long time from this pulpit. Matt says in week one, and I think only you and I laughed, he says, time heals everything except for gangrene. And nobody it laughed. It was awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> no. That's funny. Like, <laughs> so funny. Like, that's funny. Don't ask me how I know. Uh, I think a great example of this is, like, here we, we are so um, often put in a position where we speak encouragement, biblical truth into people's lives, and then you come to an opportunity where you actually have to walk what you're talking. And uh, I think a great example for us was just this summer, for a couple years, my wife has been feeling very, very called uh, into ministry and very called out of public education. And um, she can't give me any dirty looks because she's teaching the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders right now. So, um, but, you know, we're so quick to just to, to pour into people's lives the promises of God. But then it comes an opportunity where it's your turn to lay down your, your career that everyone says you should never lay down. Yeah. And then as a family unit, you sit there and look at each other and you say, is this really what we're going to do? And um, we did. And it was the best decision we ever made. And I thank the Holy Spirit. You said something earlier about obedience. I just want to kind of touch back onto that. And you also mentioned just um, dissatisf dissatisfaction. Can you say that for me? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Neither of us can. <laughs> hours of sleep, bro. Okay. So, but sometimes when you're dissatisfied, we think it's always bad. Sometimes dissatisfaction is, that's not even how you say it. Is that it. a word? Just... Sometimes being dissatisfied ah. is the Lord changing <laughs> your heart for a changing season. So when the door opens, you're ready to walk through it. And I know that happened to us at first. It was like, we were no longer satisfied with what was great forever. And then all of a sudden it's not in your heart, it's not what it once was. And that's, that's the Lord just getting you ready for a change. So when the door is kicked open, you're ready to walk through it. And um, my wife and I had so many talks about this change, and I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. And um, he was so clear to her. And I remember her saying, well, I want him to tell you. And we had an awesome moment um, just where I looked at her and I said, did he tell you? And she said, yes. And I said, well, we got married and two become one. So he told me, let's do it. And here we are. So... God's good and the Holy Spirit. I, I think so much about how much Jonah and Abraham lacked compared to us in this covenant and, and having the Holy Spirit with, with us 24-7, telling us the truths, just there to counsel us and, and advocate for us and intercede when we need it all the time. And I just, I think about even Moses, like Moses would have, he wants what you have. He wanted what we, they long to see what we see and know what we know and the knowledge. And even like, imagine Jonah, he's going through all this and like, he can't just go to the next chapter in the book and see that it's all good. You know what I mean? He didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have the cross. He didn't have our covenant. So um, I think God showed a lot of grace on them because they did it for real. And now we're learning from them. And I'm thankful for, you know, just for the word. He is the word. So time with him is time in in the word and that's our obedience to him trusting what it says too I think it's crucial also that we understand 
how dangerous it is for us to force doors open yeah. in our yes. lives. Okay, to let God, I remember, I just it thought it wasn't long ago, it was only probably not even a year ago where a brother came to me and he was all distraught. He was dismissed from his job and, and he was all distraught over things and I don't know what I'm going to do. He was an older man. And, um, and I said, listen, listen, set your affection, your heart upon the Lord. Okay, do that. Secondly, all right, if this door is closing, that means God's going to open up a better door for you. And that's exactly what the Lord did. It, it took a few months for that to transpire and for everything to be put into place. But there was a better door that was open for him. Uh, and, and the opportunities that came, came his way. But it's like you could kick this door open, but maybe what the door you're kicking open, you're not going to like what you find on the other side of that door. Okay, so let God work. Let God work. That's, that's wonderful advice. I mean, that's something I've just learned the last couple years as I'm attempting to become more mature, believe it or not, Pastor. Um, there's not really a door I want to open anymore. Because if I'm doing it, it's going to be by my intellect, <laughs> you know, what I think is best. And, and in the end, that comes down to, to me saying, I know what's best for me more so than anyone else, including the God of this universe. So if you don't mind, I'm going to kick that door open because I know what to do. And it becomes my works and my works are not, they're not going to cut it. So that, that's just such valuable advice because sometimes it's hard to wait, mm -hmm. you know, but patience is... Yeah. It's, 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 Let patience have, it, have yeah, its right. perfect work that you may be complete and entire, wanting nothing. Nothing. Well, that's a hard place to be, though. It is. So. I think it's also knowing when to move forward. Because sometimes we overstay our welcome, whether it's at a job or whatever that looks like. Because even <clears throat> as God transitions you, whether you're, say you're in the kids ministry and God's calling you to youth ministry, you could be in a way of someone else stepping into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's learning. It's like, you're making me uncomfortable. It's because I want to move you somewhere else. You know, it's so funny. Pastor Nathan and I were talking, um, the youth, they're having a lock-in next weekend. And I was like, woo! Glad we don't do that no more. Past that stage. I was like, I can't do that. And I look back, I'm like, I couldn't imagine in the stage I'm in now doing that. It's so funny because Pastor Nathan and I transitioned out of youth at the same time. I followed him. Um, I'm like, where you go, I go. And so um, <laughs> we transitioned out. It's like, looking back, it's like, but thank God when we said yes, when we were obedient, moving out of youth, the Lord opened doors. And now we have Pastor Rob and Christina. And so and what they're doing is phenomenal. And what God is doing in our lives as pastors and the growth that's happening, it's, it's cool. And it's super awesome now because it's deeper. It's going after more. And so knowing when to transition out and, and to move uh, so God can, you know, use you somewhere else and put someone right where you were. So. Well, I think, I think it's the condition of the soil, which would be your heart. Um, that, that's really, in a sense, what all of this kind of comes down to. You know, Dad, you said about set your affections. Uh, and and I, think, I think that is really where it's at because you're not, if you're really setting your affection on just seeking after Father, just going after him, just getting in his presence and allow, meditating on the word, really allowing the word to be planted, but, but really meditating on it. Um, I really feel when you're in, in those seasons, you're not gonna try to kick down your own doors. Uh, I, I just I just don't I just don't feel that I, I feel like really if you're seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness there like you said there there there's a peace uh, that just kind of leads and guides into all truth you know so like and so I think that's that's a lot of it to where it's like hey if we're if we're unsettled if we're if we're trying to rush in the situations if we're trying to go I, again I think those are those red flags that really are just like hey. I need to, I just need to like slow down a little bit. I, I think so much in life we, we've get, we get caught up in this like fast food society, this fast food mentality of like how fast can I get it? How fast can I build something? But really I think that that, that is just one of the biggest downfalls of society, of just anything. And, and there's, 
there's a, there's, a, there's a guy online that I kind of started to follow, and he's, he was like, like, everybody around me is trying to build everything as fast as they can. He was like, I'm trying to build my business as slow as I can. And it's like, that is so, that is so contrary to society because everybody wants to like win the lottery, like the quick fix, like everything else. But like, as, as we really know from the kids, but it's like slow and steady wins the race. It's the, it's the patient endurance, which builds that character inside of us, really builds the foundation, really prepares the soil of our heart for what God wants to build because any kind of any kind of plant that just springs up super fast often has a very shallow uh, root system, and it can't withstand any kind of heat or or wind or any 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 elements around it. But the things that take uh, uh, time to grow that that really build the the root system in it. When the wind and the waves come, it's like that that there's a foundation that now can withstand what's there. So I just, I just think that's a lot of it is really, is just really, if you're going to, if you're going to put effort into anything, again, I, I believe it's just seeking first the kingdom. It's making sure that the soil of your heart is pure, that it's what it, that it's what it needs to be for the seed of God's word to really be planted in it. And when that happens again, God's word will not return void. It will accomplish all that it was set forth to do. And when we're planting God's word in our heart, man, the foundation, the, the root system, it's truly going to, they're, they're truly going to like dig down deep and they're going to plant something that's going to sustain, that's going to last, that's going to continue. Uh, just, it just as you, as your journey is going, it's something that's going to continue and continue to to move you forward. But I, I think that that's, I just think that's the biggest thing is so many times we, we want to kick down those doors, be, but it's because we're impatient. We're trying to do something outside of who we're called to be or where we're called to be. And really, uh, I think of even like Elijah, it's almost like one of those things. It's like, go to the brook Cherith. And it's like, don't leave there until it dries up. And then I'll call you somewhere else. You know, but it's like, but I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting bored of this scenery. I'm getting, it's just like, but you don't understand that like everywhere else has no supply. It's just like, just stop being, and I, I think boredom is one of the, we were never designed to be bored. I, agree. I, I think that is, man, what just, what deception from the enemy thinking again that like, man, I'm bored. What, what else can I be doing? And it's like, that again is such a major, major red flag because it's like when we're seeking first the kingdom, how can we ever be bored when we're truly in our father's presence, when we're with him? Because we are satisfied on every level when we're in him. So again, I believe that that's like a heart check. That's like a reality check to be like, man, I'm bored. Well, I, I, then we need to check our heart there. And that system is like, wait a minute, like what's, what's going on? Why am I feeling this way? You know? And again, I, I think it's, it's now coming back. It's like, what's the condition of my soil? Because if I'm getting bored, if I'm dissatisfied, I'm all those things, I need to check the condition of my soil because, because that, that means that the something, something's out of balance. So, so I, I just, I just think that that's a, that's a big thing. So I want to, before we have to close here, because I found some really neat information concerning Jonah and fish. God prepared a great fish. And I, I, I never saw this before, but anyhow, it's, it, I, one of the things here, it says, a Mediterranean fish has been caught whose head alone weighed six tons, okay? And whose jaws had an opening of eight feet. In the April in in the April fourth, eighteen ninety six, uh, Literary Digest, a story was recounted of a whale in the Mediterranean Sea that destroyed a harpoon boat and swallowed a sailor named James Bartley. A day and a half later, Bartley was found alive in the whale's belly with only his skin tanned by the gastric juices. Another fish caught off the coast of Florida weighed 15 tons 
and had a 1,500 pound fish in its belly, according to the day annotated uh, reference Bible. Pretty cool. You want to stop and think? Did John Wisniewski catch that one in Florida? Um, yeah. He better have a big pole. He <laughs> yeah. better have a big pole for that one. 15, 15 tons. But that, I, that be, the reason, or how I got into that, because I got the pondering as Jonah yeah. was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So Jesus said, so would the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And it's like, how did that happen? If he was crucified on Friday and rose again on Sunday, how does that work? And I found some information on that too. Okay. And I thought this is fascinating stuff in a sense. That's why I kind of had to squeeze it in there. All right. Um, uh, from, <laughs> from Andrew Walmack, <laughs> nevertheless. All right. Um, Yes, I wanted to make sure I got the right one here. It has been traditionally taught that Jesus was crucified and buried on a Friday and resurrected on a Sunday, the first day of the week. And however, here Jesus prophesied being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's always bugged me. How does that work? And I've even tried to figure it out. You know, like, well, maybe if we move this over here and no, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work. Okay, that would mean the crucifixion took place at least on a Thursday or possibly even on a Wednesday, depending on when you believe Jesus was resurrected. John 20 verse 1 shows that Mary Magdalene found that Jesus was already resurrected while it was still dark. That means Jesus actually rose from the dead sometime during the night prior to sunrise. If Jesus' statement in this verse is interpreted as meaning three complete nights, Saturday night could not be included and would thus push the crucifixion and burial back to Wednesday. Um, at any rate, Friday could not have been the day Jesus was crucified. And he goes on to write this, and I thought, this is fascinating. And I said, maybe it means nothing to anyone else, but, but I like to understand these things. The reason the crucifixion was traditionally set on Friday, in fact, actually the New Living Translation stated that he died on a Friday. But when you go into every other translation other than God's Word translation, these are the only two translations that mentions the word Friday. Every other one, it just doesn't, it doesn't give the day. Okay, so the reason uh, the crucifixion was traditionally set on Friday was because of the misunderstanding of verses like Luke 23, 54, which I won't take time to read that, that speak of the Sabbath as being the day after the crucifixion. That's what I always thought. However, as can be clearly seen in John 19, 31, and I never realized this, the Sabbath spoken of was a high or special Sabbath, okay? Specifically, it was the Feast of the Passover, of course. Duh. All right? These special feasts were called Sabbaths also. Regardless of the day of the week on which they fell. So it could have been because it was a high hol or a high day or a high Sabbath because of the Feast of the Passover. It could have been any day of the week, and it was still considered a Sabbath. So now when you put that into perspective, it's easy to understand what Jesus meant by that, that he would be in the heart of the earth, in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So I just found that interesting. That is, that is super cool. Is that a mic drop too? <laughs> I think so. I mean, that's like your third one. Oh, tonight. really? Yeah. Wow. It must be a record. <laughs> and Dan is like, thank goodness we put that one on his ear. He'd be dropping mics all over. <laughs> yeah. And, and they also counted the day beginning and end at sundown. Yeah. Right. Not midnight like we did. So, yeah, there's... Yeah. Yeah. The Sabbath began at 6 o'clock in the evening, to my understanding. Yeah. That's when the next day began, yeah. 6 o'clock in the evening. And I even tried to jiggle those, those times to make it fit. And uh, I thought then, uh, I just never realized, I never thought that this was a special 
Sabbath because it was the feast of the Passover when it was being celebrated. So, like he said, it could have been on a Wednesday, could have been on a Thursday, depending. So uh, now it makes sense how Jesus could have been in the belly or the heart of the earth for three days and three nights like that. So interesting. That's very cool. I don't know if anybody has any... Um we didn't get to love others, the hardest one of the whole questions, but we'll have to save that for another time, um, talking about how Jonah had more compassion for a plant than he did people, and how, you know, it's important for us as we are God's people, we show our love to others as if we love God then we love others. You can't really separate. And I don't know if we have, if you have any parting thoughts on that, I'd be, well, or, or anything. Actually, right. I do. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hold your mics, folks. All right. <laughs> now you made me lose my thought. Okay. Uh, no, actually, the only thing I'd say about that, because I thought this is so crucial also, if you really love someone, don't feed their problem. Don't feed their issues, okay? Because you're only being used of the enemy. And I found this, and I wasn't even looking for this, but I was digging through, some, through, my, through this book and cleaning out some old teachings, and I found this one that we had from John Bevere, Bait of Satan. And, and I thought, this fits perfect. Bevere says, once I was severely hurt by a couple of ministers, people would say, I can't believe they did this to you. They're feeding the problem, okay? Aren't you hurt by that? And the, the, the thing is, again, if you really love them, don't feed things that are going to cause even a greater hurt or drive the wound deeper. Find a way to have them release, release the... Uh, uh, the hurt that may be in there. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Proverbs chapter chapter 26. I want to read this to you because it's, it's, it's great. I, I just used this today over a situation. And I said, listen, just, just let it ride. Be at peace. Quit stirring the pot, okay? Because the more you stir it, the more the enemy's going to use it. Proverbs 26, verse 20 and 21. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no talebearer, the strife ceases. Verse 21. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So if you really love people, don't feed their hurt. Help them out of their situation, not drive them deeper into it. And that's my thought on that. And, and don't let Facebook be the gasoline of that either. Oh. <laughs> yes. We all, we all yeah. know that person. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Nathan, you feel, I feel like you got, want, you got something to take us home with. I feel it. You're uh, well, knowing that time right there, you don't want me taking you home, Matt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can you take us normally I get home about midnight, one in the morning, can you and it's us, not. Can you take us home in six it's like, seconds? Good. Uh, yeah, the, ca the cafe, my belly is like, got to get to that cafe. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I, I've just been staring at this verse all night. Billy and I were talking about it earlier. Um, but it's in, it's in John 14. And uh, this is Jesus saying, it says, Jesus replied to them, um, and this is, this is when Judas, not as scary, said, Lord, uh, why is it that you only reveal your identity to us and not, and not to everyone? And, and I, I just, I love how Jesus just always, again, just goes straight for it. And his reply is, loving me empowers you to obey my word. But I, I think that this is, this is so amazing. It says, and my father will love you so deeply that we will come to you and make you are our dwelling place. That is just like so powerful to me that that all of these aspects about loving God and trusting him and loving his people. It's like, man, when we just love God, when we just when our hearts are pure, as we, we talk tonight, when we're just seeking first the kingdom, 
It's just like loving me empowers you to obey my word. If we're gonna walk in his will for our lives, loving him, going after him is gonna empower us to walk in his will, to walk in his calling, to walk in his purpose, to walk in his plan, to walk in his identity for our lives. And um, I mean, that's just, that to me, and I mean, this verse, I don't even know if that's for me on Sunday, but uh, but gosh, everything, Second Peter 1, everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been lavished upon us yes. through, through his glory, through his goodness, from being enfolded into Christ. And uh, I just, that to me is just loving God, loving him empowers me, loving him empowers me to obey his word. And that, that to me, it's just like to fulfill all of these aspects, to love God, to trust him, to love people. It's like, man, like we just, none of it happens without first resting in him, knowing our identity in him. Because really like, man, we can only love God. We're only, we only come to him out of, out of a calling, out of a response to his love for us. And and, and then when we surrender that, when we surrender who we are, I think, I think Jonah is a great plan of that. Somewhere along the line, Jonah took his plan in the purpose that he set for his life in, in, in this, this, again, this plan, this, this whatever that he, the, that he had. He finally, a lot like Job, somewhere along the line, and there's, what, 42 chapters or whatever in Job, towards, Job had his own plan. Jonah had his own plan. But God has his plan, and you will always just be just banging your head against that wall over and over and over until you recognize and realize that, man, like, it's, it's not about God fitting us and fitting who we are and God fitting our plan. It's us surrendering who we are to his plan and then allowing his purpose and his plan and his goodness to pull us into his freedom, and now we can operate in his life and everything we do. So. so Matt asks, what's God's will? We asked that a half hour ago. Verse 24 goes on to say, in closing, of course, but those who don't love me will not obey my words. Mm. The Father did not send me to speak my own revelation, but the words of my Father. So anytime we have a question of what God's will for our life is, look for the red words. It's the only thing that can define his will for our life. Amen. Yeah. Awesome. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been really great. I hope everybody has, you know, heard some experiences and has um, even got some insight into Jonah and maybe you can apply it to your life. And thank you. And turn it over to you to close us out, I guess, or whatever, whatever we do next. Matt, uh, why don't you close us in prayer? Okay. <laughs> All right, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. That's where it begins, Lord. That's how we know you. It's we know you love us, Lord. Let our response to your word be to love you, to trust you, and to love others, Lord. Yes. That to take the examples of the men and women in the Bible who've, who've done um, great and not so great things, Lord, but you still loved them, and you still cared about them, and you gave their stories to us yes. so that we could learn how to love you and to have you make your home in our hearts so that we'll never be alone here on earth or forever and that we can share that with others. So let's just go out and share that with others and let us be an even greater example of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that you were blessed and encouraged by our service. We invite you to join us again next week. Our services go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and at wordoflife.church. And we also meet in person every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. If God is using our church to change your life and you'd like to help us lead people to life in Jesus through your generous giving, you can do so by visiting wordoflife.church give, or you can text your donation amount to 84321. Follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube if you'd like to know more about what God is doing in and through Word of Life Church. God is doing incredible things here, and we are so honored that you chose to spend your time with us.